or start small and big, but take opportunities. And if there aren't any, make them. For example, I always wanted to go to the Innovation Summit and usually there was no chance of me getting in because I was just the child. But if you take up that opportunity, you can go. If there's no opportunities, join a group that can make you get more opportunities and get them and make them. For example, I taught them how to make posters for helping children during this morally struggling time. And we did it, people benefited. If you don't have any opportunities, just make them. Andre Mikalev is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas. Andre is 12 years old and lives in Rabat, Malta. We met in 2018 at the Malta Innovation Summit. He listened to a podcast about business and they spoke on innovation and that sparked him on a journey to not only attend the Malta Innovation Summit, but a journey that has taken him a lot further in his ideas and growth and development as a wonderful youth to think about the environment, think about how he can participate in solving our global grand challenges that we're faced with. And since Andre started this journey, he's also been fortunate enough to participate in the EU Eurochild program, which we will have him tell us about that very soon. Andre. It's actually an NGO, not EU, but. It's, it's an NGO within yes. the United uh, European Union? Yes. Great. As great. in it's privately run, but. Oh, wow. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, Andre, and it's good to see you. How have you been? Very good. How are you? I am most excellent. I'm doing very well. Things are, are keeping busy, as you know. Um, you know, during this time of the, the pandemic and crazy things going on around the world, uh, we only had the fortune and ability to meet once, uh, and it was virtual. Uh, and that yeah. was on an unconference at the Unite Global, where you came in a, a, a couple minutes late to a presentation I was giving, but it was so good to see you. That was kind of a, almost at the beginning of the pandemic, right? Pretty much April around there. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm really anxious <clears throat> to get my listeners kind of updated on how we met and, and how how have you been and kind of what your experiences have been on this journey of uh, innovation, sustainability, and also during the time of the pandemic. And so <clears throat> I want to ask you, how have you weathered the pandemic? How has this time been for you? Can you give us a little bit of an insight into what your life's been and what your thoughts and your feelings have been during this time? So first of all, everyone gets a bit of anxiety from the pandemic because you don't know who has what. Maybe he has COVID-19, maybe he doesn't. But I took the time to research. I bought an Arduino development board to learn with that. And then I said, how can I use this to help the environment? I did a bunch of, a bunch of research and there are so many ways we can use it. For example, for crop yields, which is more important than actually giving people who do not have food, food, because they should be able to make it themselves independently, rather than us always having to give them. So I found one where you can make a weather monitoring station with a solar panel. There are so many things on the cert that we can do to help. But the problem is we do not take the time to help. Everyone's stuck on their phones doing nothing when you could be stuck on your phone doing something. Yeah, yeah. I, I wanna even, I, I'm glad to hear that you did some research and that you're, you're kind of discovering the new options and possibilities out there. 
I really want to, if you don't mind, give me an insight to you and your family, how your thoughts, your feelings, what you did, uh, you know, how, how was school during this time? How was uh, you and your sister, your mom and your dad, how, how, how did that look? How did it feel? Was it scary? Was it weird? Was it, uh, you know, give me a little bit more of an insight on, on, you know, how did it affect your world or did through your innovation knowledge, through what you've been doing before the pandemic came and your journey, um, your mom's an educator or was an educator and how has that whole thing maybe have helped you to weather the pandemic or what kind of experiences did you have during the time? So my mother and my father and my sister, they weren't scared. I was super scared because obviously Malta is a small country, very little people. So if one person gets it, there's a chance that 30 other people get it. I was anxious at the beginning of the pandemic while they were super chill which I don't think was the good mindset for them to have. But that's just my opinion. But when we came back to school, everything was a lot more anxious, especially during PE, where everyone was without their masks, running around, exercising. That was scared. In fact, this week I actually managed to start to sit in. It's pretty tough. You just barely started to settle settle in this week again, or? Yep, and it's school has been going for about two weeks. Wow, wow! You you had some um, new things occur. So when we first met in 2018 at the Malta Innovation Summit, um, you were kind of struggling with your school situation and not not that happy. And I I think that worked out a little bit in your. Yeah. You're pretty happy now, but can you tell us what was going on and, and that transition and w w what made it better for you? So I had a school where there were a bunch of bullies and the school didn't really do much. But when the option came to switch schools, my mother she didn't think it was good because I had my friends. But then I told her to enter the Refn. She could have just entered from the beginning and I would have already been there because she's an educator. But she didn't want to, so we had to be in God's hands. And thankfully, he helped us get into a good school, my favorite school, which is actually doing quite a bit on the environment and quite a bit on innovation. It's probably the most innovative school on Malta. And, and that, that's interesting and great to hear because uh, like I said in the beginning, we met at the Malta Innovation Summit. So I, I kind of touched upon it a little bit, but could you tell us how, how did it even start that you, you got to be at the Malta Innovation Summit? And then, um, something unique happened at, at that, that summit where you actually got to get up on stage and talk a little bit and interact, which wasn't planned at all. So can you give us how you got there? It's and a very, us, very funny story. Tell, tell us a little bit about that. So I kept asking my mother if I could go. She said she'll see. So she called the organizer on the phone and she asked, is there an age limit? And he said, there is an approximate one, 16. So she said, see you in five years as I have a son who's 11 or 10, I don't remember the age, who, who would like to come. He said, wait, 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 don't cut. Come, we'll give you free tickets. And we came, we enjoyed it. Then we actually met, uh, I forgot his name. I believe it was Chris. Chris he yeah. had the book. Yeah, Chris was- I met him in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. He introduced me to the introducer. And 
he then asked the organizer if he could interview me. And that's how it all happened. Wow. So then you they asked, Chris? You met they Chris. asked if I could okay. be next year. Mm -hmm. And it happened. 2019, I was a speaker. That's amazing. So um, Chris was one of the speakers and you met him in the bathroom. And then he connected you to the moderator and to the organizer. And they asked if they could interview you up on stage, which would happen. And then what you, you were asked to be a speaker in 2019. Tell me about that. What happened? How was that? My goodness. It was amazing. I spoke on the innovation summit. Oh, my, my mistake. I spoke on the innovators mindset because they're very similar things. And I spoke on how we can use it to improve life. How we can use it to make stuff. I showed that Lego for one is actually quite an amazing tool to teach children to become innovators. Because with that, you can basically make anything. You can make a utopia and you can dream about it and then actually put yourself to work doing this. Because a pile of bricks isn't going to build a house. You have to build it. That's amazing. So it sounds like it uh, turned out very nice and it was, uh, it was a great talk and I, I like the topic. So um, how, how much research study did you have to do to prepare for that? Was that, was that stressful? Was that something that took a long time or, or just your journey? Uh, did you learn it naturally? I read a book. So I took that book. I took that knowledge. I adjusted it for Malta, I added some stuff, and then you've got a speech. Wow, that's amazing. That's really fabulous. So that, that's quite a journey from a bathroom encounter to speaking on stage. And then tell me about this uh, Euro child and exactly what that is, what type of a program or NGO that is and, and what you did there or what you learned and what that was about? Sure. At age nine, I joined an NGO called the President's Foundation for Wellbeing of Society. It's now Malta Foundation, the Malta Foundation for Wellbeing of Society. And they were part of a group called the NEFs, National Eurochild Forums. So Anyone who was of age at around 11 and a half to 18 could go abroad and actually speak. So the year that our nephew became the president of Eurochild, I was actually allowed to go up as something in the Euro Child staff members group really impressed them. So they sent me up, I was the youngest speaker there. And I spoke about how we can use technology in education. It's really just a journey that you have to start yourself with and you end up somewhere you don't know. That's fabulous. That is absolutely wonderful. So uh, after, um we met at the innovation summit i connected with your mother through facebook and and uh, uh your dad through emails and we kind of uh have exchanged and kept in contact that way you and i were um through through messenger and things and and you you you've showed up at some of my speaking events or watched some of my speaking events and reached out to me as well and, and told me that you that you've been following me um, which I really appreciate. Thank you very, very much. Um, but I'm really interested to hear, you know, on, on how your journey has been so positive and how, how that's gone. Um, there's been some crazy things going on in the world, right? Uh, yeah. And you, you, you've told us about the pandemic and how your thoughts and feelings were about some of those things, but there is a much more 
overlaying effect um, or bigger effect that's been going on and it's really climate change and biodiversity loss and I know that you and your sister and your family you know I see birds uh, and um, fish and animals and things that you guys really care about nature and, and other species and and uh, of doing things like that what what are your feelings towards this overwhelming big problem that we're having with climate change and with biodiversity and how we interact with the rest of our world is there anything that you can tell us about that or your thoughts or feelings on your journey of learning and in, in, in that direction sure so first of all we can use energy harvesting as a method to transfer from one side being non-renewable energy to renewable energy as energy harvesting is kind of the middle so we can start with that we can even purchase small solar panels and slowly slowly hopefully a bit faster than that, get to fully renewable. Since these stuff are still being developed, they're not as reliable as non-renewable, but we can try to use them both to our advantage. And, and so that's more on the renewable transition, but what's the connection to to the climate and to to the environment and and just your daily lives. When I look at uh, um, your your mother's Facebook and some of the pictures of you guys out, you know, swimming or interacting with nature that you do, how, how does that all connect with with renewables or, or or what you just mentioned? As you know, non renewables have a devastating effect on the environment. In fact, in many countries, they are actually dumping oil into the Mediterranean, which is surrounding us. If we want our places to be really, really nice, like they sort of are now, like they were in the past, we need to actually work for it by implementing renewables, by doing compost. I know many people that do not do that. By recycling, there are many people who do not do that either. And that recycling and composting, that's kind of more like a circular economy, regenerative agriculture. That's kind of this closed system, um, which I don't know if you know, is really, really ties into innovation. Um, you've probably heard some of my talks in the past about moonshot thinking and some, some types of um, sustainable innovations, innovations for purpose to solve global grand challenges. The unique thing about those innovations and those technologies is they are very efficient. They're very um, much a closed system where it has this moonshot thinking or principles. How can we continue to get energy and, a, and, and that in a closed system in the depths of outer space or on the moon or at, in Mars or in this outer space. And, the, and it's not because we want to go there, but it's because when you're in a closed system in outer space, you can't waste energy. You can't create toxic problems with your soils or the way you produce food or the way you produce energy because it's a closed system in very short amount of time, those problems or those bad ways of producing uh, energy or, or, or food really come to the surface quickly. And, and uh, you know, let's say if you're in outer space and you're, you're trying to grow food and you waste energy or you put chemicals or fertilizers in a cl closed system on, on those food products, that could affect your health as someone who's up there in that closed environment. Now, we're also in a closed environment on our earth. And so it just takes a little bit longer to get to us and, and affect us all around the world. When we were on uh, the call together for Unite Global, the UNCONference, and you came in, 
you mentioned something that you'd learned something new about the bees and some biodiversity loss that we're having in regards to bees. What was that? And what was your thoughts or why was that concerning you at that time? I believe it was about the parasite that is killing bees. The American and brooding disease? I believe so. And there are many other ways that bees are being killed. Bees are the most important insect. If bees die, we're all going to die. Bees are the ones who do most of the pollination. Once pollen is out, plants are out. So that's cut off of food number one. Once the plants are out, our last source of food, meat, will also be out. And we're all dying. That's a big problem currently. Boy, that sounds scary. You're, you're scaring me. We're <laughs> all going to die. I don't want to die. I want to be innovative and think of, of new ways and positive ways that we can fix the problems and solve our global grand challenges and live we in We need harmony. to do that before we die. Because yeah. eventually we're all going to die. <laughs> yeah, we will. We will all eventually die. But I would like to see uh, you have a beautiful future and my grandchildren and my children ha have a beautiful future and that we, we uh, live a long time in a very resilient, beautiful world. So we need innovators. We need people who are thinking about the big picture and a long term, how we can sustain ourselves. Um, and that's really important that we have people who are thinking about the solutions and acting differently. Are there certain things that you and your family have done different during this time of the pandemic than, than before the pandemic? Maybe ways that you've changed or your buying habits or anything that's, that you've noticed or that might, might be positive that you've learned We've from We've definitely this. cut down on food. Mm -hmm. That's for one. Entertainment like movies, there hasn't been all year. Basically, at first we stocked up food when when it was all the way in Italy, because we knew that people would be buying like crazy once it hit Sicily, and the day later it hit Sicily. So at first we were buying quite a bit. It lasted us two months, which was enough for the riots to calm down, which was good thinking because we knew that these were happening in America and other places. But then we cut down quite a bit on buying. For example, food, we don't really buy any more snack food. We bought a bit, we buy a few every month. Obviously, this month we're going to buy a bit extra because you know, Halloween. Yeah. But we basically cut down a lot. We've do you gotten guys much have a fitter. vegetable garden? Do you guys grow your own food at all? Do you do any um, sprouting? How do you feel about vegetables and growing? I'm your waiting own food? for parts to arrive to make a nursery garden for foods, which will automatically water them. Because let's be frank, no one likes really watering plants, but it's important. So far. My mother has done it a bit, but not too much success. It's about what we did. That's cool. Well, I appreciate you sharing that with me. And I want to get to one, one of our real first questions. And it is, do you feel like you're a global citizen? And how would you feel about a world or a future with no nations, borders, or divisions of humanity, that you were a global citizen. Do you have any thoughts or feelings about that or what you'd like to share with me? Yes, I do feel that I am a global citizen as I feel that everyone should just become part of one country with a quote unquote prison country like Christmas Island for those who are a threat to society. So isolating the bad so that they learn and get rehab, then setting them free in a world with endless possibilities. 
That's great. I, I love to hear that. That's probably the most unique answer I've ever received on the show so far. We also so need to take down racial borders. It's extremely prevalent in our countries. You see people telling people, go back to your country because this is going to be the truth that I'm laying down right here. We have too many immigrants. Malta is a tiny country and we're okay with immigrants, but too many is too many. We're getting full of people. Obviously, as you know, we don't want to all be tightly packed like in New York. New York is an exception because people like it there. But imagine an entire country like that. That's a bit too much. That's, that's really interesting perspective and thanks for sharing that with you. You've brought up um, the, the Black Lives Matter or racism a lot. What, what, what are your feelings on, on that and, and what do you understand about that that's going on? It's not just in the United States, it's actually occurring all over the world. What are your thoughts and feelings? I feel that all races should be equal, but we should still respect cultures because many people are bringing their cultures with them. And that's positive, but they're destroying our culture at the same time. Maltese is actually starting to fade out. As less people are learning it, it's starting to die. And we don't really want our culture to die like many other people don't want theirs. So I think we should respect their cultures, but they should learn ours at the same time. Because many people in Mota don't even know English. Although there are a few exceptions, like the older original Maltese, like my grandfather who only speaks Maltese and very little but bad English. Wow. So yeah, so they they don't speak the Maltese language and... and uh, it's dying off. Yeah, it's dying off. I... I I agree that um, we need that diversity, that we need that gender equality and the diversity of cultures and that um, they should be able to exist in the same place. And um, no matter what race or color or um, culture, religion, that uh, we should all kind of interact and work together as humanity and not segregate ourselves. That's an, a different way of separating ourselves. We should be ourselves. like Singapore or Albania, for example, where religions and ethnicities, those sorts of groups are allowed. That's beautiful. Yeah, I, I totally agree. So uh, you see the map behind me of the world. Um, and if you look at, and you, you've seen me speak before a couple of times, I always show the picture of the, the blue marble, the earth from outer space. And on, on both of those pictures, they're uh, basically telling us that we're all on the same spaceship earth. We're all the same species, homo sapiens. We're moving in the same planet. And really that we're distant cousins from each other. We're all very closely, not only the same species, but related to each other very closely and that we shouldn't be separating or dividing ourselves from it, from one or another, that we should find ways to interact and live together and, and in harmony. So I really appreciate your views and your understandings of, of, of not only being a global citizen, but also how you understand these social distancing and racial uh, problems with Black Lives Matters and many others that are occurring around the world with things. I, I, I'm going to go and jump into the, the hardest question that I have for you today. And it's the big question. It's the burning question, WTF. And you've probably heard me say this before, and it's not a swear word. It's what's the future? And so uh, you, as a youth, as someone who uh, has had a, a journey in the last couple of years on innovation and learning things at a pretty rapid pace, do you think about the future and what is the future for you? What's your vision or what's your thoughts on, on where we're going or, or what we can expect? My future, or how I would like it to be, 
is where we actually recycle. I'm quite into electronics, so I'm taking apart old machines and turning them into new machines. We should all be doing that because at the end of the day, tech gets thrown away left and right when people need that tech, number one. There are many countries and people who people should donate to. You see many people actually destroying tech on YouTube. But those should actually be used for positivity, even for Internet of Things. Do you know what that is? Yes, yes. IoT, a phone is perfect. If you have an old phone, it's got a bunch of sensors you can use to help humanity. For example, crop yields. You can set up phones all around, program them to detect discolorations. And once they see discolorations in a plant, they will send an SMS. Because at the end of the day, phones are SMS machines. They have the GSM modules. They have everything that you could possibly need. They have a screen, two cameras, some of them only one, but. Yeah, it's like um, they're, they're really smart. You know, the smartphones are computers in your pocket, in your hand. They have a lot of tech in there that really can, can help for other things. And it's, um, you know, that's another thing that I talk about, which I agree with you. We shouldn't be making things to then be thrown away. We should realize that on our planet, there is no throwaway. Everything that we throw away, it still remains here on our earth. And so if we can think circular economy and reuse and recycle and refurbish and repurpose, we take those things and don't bury them or burn them or just throw them away that we take them apart. We try to reuse those parts. We try to use the precious metals or the materials in them to make something new and keep it in a continual closed system. Uh, and that goes back to what I was telling you about this moonshot idea or how they act in space or in the ISS space station. They uh, pretty much reuse and recycle almost everything that's there. There's very little that goes to waste. Even the human waste of the astronauts there is recycled and reused and repurposed in one way or the other. And so um, it's, it's really important that we get into that mindset. And is that, one, is that a mindset that you've started to shift or, or did you always have that? Or is that something that happened on this journey that you've been on that you've kind of learned that those things are important? Obviously, as a baby, you never have a mindset. So yeah. I believe that all mindsets are learned. So I believe I learned it over time. When I was young, I was always researching when I could, obviously. And that sparked my interest. And it set up a chain reaction, which made me learn all the things that I need to know to be here and to help the environment. Wow, that's fabulous. I really, I really appreciate that. And I love that way of thinking and that you've had so much uh, progress since we very first met and, and that you're continuing on this journey. And um, I wanna know if you've um, ever heard of the Sustainable Development Goals. The UN. The, United, the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Yes, yes, I have. Have you ever heard me speak about them? I don't know them by heart, them? but I've heard them. Yeah, have you heard me speak about them or? I believe so. Okay. My memory is a bit. Yeah, that's fine. Um, do, you, do you know what they are or what, what, why they're important or? I know that they are for child rights, human rights, racial rights, and uh, all the rights that you could have along with food goals. For example, they're trying to make people in Africa meals. They have an app so far that for 17 cents, you can give someone a meal. But yeah, think about a it, meal. Yeah. 17 cents a meal, that's three meals a day, 365 days a year. I think that we should be shifting that idea to what NASA is doing. They're sending satellites to help out with the crop yields. I'm mainly speaking about crop yields, but 
that's the most important. We need to get people on their feet because they're still developing countries. We're fully developed. But if we want them to actually develop with our help, we don't want them to become reliant on us. We want them to become self-reliant with our technology. So with That's simple great. technology, we can do that. I want to tell you and just our listeners and any other of your friends who hopefully will listen in as well. Um, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are 17 very colorful goals laid out from 1 to 17. And they are really <clears throat> for each and every one of us. And they are called Sustainable Development Goals because they are goals for us to reach and achieve um, the future and uh, are so vital for our roadmap and plan to reach the future. And so yeah. most of us honestly don't, even though they might've heard somebody speak about them in the past, don't understand who they're for and what they're for. And they're for each of us as individuals. And I wanna, uh, you know, for our listeners, I'll just tell you there are 17 sustainable development goals and the number one is no poverty, number two is zero hunger, three is good health and well-being, number four is quality education, number five is gender equality, six is clean water and sanitation, seven is affordable and clean energy, eight is decent work and economic growth, nine is industry innovation and infrastructure, ten is reduced inequalities, 11 is sustainable cities and communities. 12 is responsible consumption and production. 13 is climate action. 14 is life below water. 15 is life on land. And 16 is peace, justice, and strong institutions. And 17 is partnership for the goals. Um, when we were presented with them, if we were presented with them, if we know about them at all, they were pre presented to us a very linear and lateral fashion from one to 17. And we didn't understand, are they for cities, countries, corporations, governments, who, who are these goals for? But I want, yeah, they're actually really for everyone. And that's what I want to make clear um, to everyone, why they're so important. And um, September 24th, 2015, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals uh, were released. They were uh, ratified and accepted and agreed upon by 197 countries. This was a historical precedence. It was a historical moment on our earth because the only time before that that we'd done not only a moonshot or we'd agreed upon something was the that when John F. Kennedy sent uh, some astronauts to the moon, to outer space to, to get to the moon. And that was just a couple of countries and a few thousand uh, key influ influential players in that movement. But I want you to realize that 197 countries came together for the first time ever and agreed upon the Sustainable Development Goals as a roadmap, a plan to the future. And if you know, since you live in, in Malta and is surrounded by water and, and that, you know how a ship functions, a ship without a plan a navigation, without a rudder will never reach its, its destination or its goal. And the same thing with our earth, countries, nations, if we don't have a plan for the future, we're never gonna reach that. And this, uh, this is, amazing because it's a historical precedence that so many countries came together for the first time ever. And it's the first global moonshot for the world. And if, if you know anything about delegates or politicians or countries, it's hard enough for two of them to agree together where they're going to go eat lunch or where, you know, what they're going to do on agriculture or, or anything let alone 197 agree on a roadmap and a plan for the future. 
All 17 of the goals are tied to agriculture, seafood, food and beverages. And I'm sorry that we didn't present the goals properly to everybody. And um, I, I want to apologize for the UN and for those that we don't really understand what they're for. If I tell people I'm a sustainable development goal advocate, they like, oh, I like number one red. It's my favorite color. That's the one I'm working on. And I want everybody to know that even if you were to pick number one, no poverty and just work on that, it is virtually impossible just to work on one sustainable development goal and not touch on all the others because they're tied together as a system to solve our global grand challenges to get us to a better future and to keep us below 1.5 degrees of warming. And one, one very critical um, SDG is number nine, industry, innovation, and infrastructure. And that's something that you love and you talk about. Another one that you talk about a lot is number seven, affordable and clean energy. So what are the renewables? What are the innovations to reach a better future? Uh, and since so many people don't understand the sustainable development goals or who they're for and what they're for, I wrote this manifesto it's a, a manifesto that kind of it, um, puts you in the future of what it will feel like December 2030 to stand and be, be in a spot where we've achieved and reached all these goals, what that world would look and feel like. And so if you would bear with me and you would be so kind to just listen and all our listeners to maybe close their eyes as I read this manifesto to you, and I want you to feel what it would feel like if we all reach this, this point in time by December 2030, what a world would feel like and what you would feel like living in such a world. And I'm gonna read that to you now. Imagine a world where there is no poverty and zero hunger. We have good health and well-being, quality education and full gender equality everywhere. There is clean water and sanitation for everyone. Affordable and clean energy has created decent work and sustainable economic growth. Our prosperity is fueled by investments in resilient industry, innovation, and infrastructure. And that has reduced inequalities. We live in sustainable cities and communities and responsible consumption and production has healed our planet. Climate action has stopped and reversed the warming of our planet and we have flourishing life below water and abundant diverse life on land. We enjoy peace and justice through strong institutions and have built long-term partnerships for the goals. I thank you because I don't know about you, but when I read that, when I hear it, that's the future I want to live in. That's one where there's gender equality, diversity, where we have a solid infrastructure, where we know where we're going in the future. And all 17 SDGs are tied to food and they're tied to the basic needs of humanity. And so I appreciate you letting me jump in on, on your part of the podcast and, and explain that to everybody because it's really important to know how if we work towards that, if we apply those goals into our life, we're gonna also reach a, a much desirable, more better future. And it'll be a nice infrastructure, a nice um, way of thinking where we do circular economy principles, where we do environmental social governance. And so uh, I, I, I really wanted to share that with you and our listeners, and hopefully you'll have your friends and, and people from school also listening so that they can understand that they can play a part in that. Now, I don't know if you know uh, uh, Andreas Vizgerdes. He was also at the Malta Innovation Summit. He started, um, uh, he did a, a very successful project on um, mobility and telephones um, that I believe was sold to Orange uh, in, in, in Europe, and uh, he lives in Malta. He's also on the board of a 
a, a company called Manabu. And I told you about Manabu and Manabu is something that has to do with the sustainable development goals, but it's a it's basically made for youth um, to participate and wherever they're at on the sustainable development goals and raise awareness in a fun, nice way. Andreas has some children and they've participated in Croatia and in Malta and some cleanup projects around the sustainable development goals. And I've, I would really love it if you and your friends, um, if you're interested and you wanna know more about that, that you would get in touch with, with Andreas in, in Malta and see how you could participate in Manabu. They have not only nice little rewards for, for participating and kind of joining a movement to clean up and make our world a beautiful and better place, but also we have the need for people like you, Andre, who are innovators and who are thinking about the future to add those parts into Manabu to, to make our world much better and thinking in a different way. Will do. I appreciate that. And so I'll, I'll make sure that after the podcast that uh, I, I get you guys together and that, um, that we uh, put you on that right path. I have... Um, if, if I may yes. just say one Go thing, ahead. you don't need to be smart or you don't need to properly take action to actually help out with the UN development goals. You can even just repurpose your computers, your old computers, just to do that. There's a specific software, it's called Boink. You can set it up on your computer. You can help with COVID-19 research and development. You can help with stopping world hunger. You can set up your computing power to help other people. So you don't need to be a genius. You don't need to be someone who does stuff. You can be lazy and help at the same time. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, there, there's a lot that we can do. There's so many parts and, and things that we can do, whether it's lending our computers, our computing power, our internet, our things to help solve some problems, whether it's going out and cleaning up our own communities and neighborhoods and parks. It's the way we change on how we buy. Uh, we don't buy things that have a lot of plastic and pollute or harm our world with bad fossil fuels. There's many, many things to do. And I like your attitude that uh, anybody can do it. And um, I believe that that uh, we're, we're all really distant cousins. And so the more we figure out how to self-sustain ourselves, then we can help our distant cousins and others around us and our community and our families to make those good decisions as well. Um, what can we expect to see and come from, from you and your family in the future? Do you have some plans when um, things um, in this great reset, when we kind of move past pandemic and, and um, get, get out of this that you're planning on or things that you're currently doing moving forward? What are your goals and your plans for the future? My family are definitely not going to do anything. Maybe my mother a bit because they don't really like to do research and that stuff. My sister is young, so she just wants to play. Uh -huh. And my father has his own business, which he's already stressed about. <laughs> so I'm really the one doing the action here. And you can probably expect maybe a conference or two. I know that the Malta Innovation Summit is not coming. It would have already passed by now. But hopefully next year, once the, the things are done, we can go to summits. We can sort out stuff. I managed to get to that Eurochild Summit just a bit before COVID. So I was lucky. But hopefully we can do a bunch more this year, as in next year. And hopefully we can inspire some change in young children because there isn't really that many places here in Malta. What, uh, I got a question for you. So are you working with any of your friends in school or 
are you, you have like a, a a team or a group or anybody that you're collaborating with or mentors that are kind of helping you and pushing you forward or or any organizations besides your own child that that are helping you to to kind of join forces with people or are you just kind of doing this all on your own as i said the president's foundation for well-being of society but other than that i'm pretty much doing it on my own i mean i'm part of student council but this year we're not having it and the next year i'm planning to join eco scola because i decided to take a break because of my old school but hopefully those many many places can help me on my journey to become a global citizen <laughs> that's fabulous so i have three last uh, questions for you and they're more or less for the listeners and our audience um they're from you as something kind of a, a, a tip or a trick or help that you can give others, other, other youth, other children, other people who are interested in moving forward um, as, as something that they maybe could apply into their life. So if there is one message that you could depart to our listeners as a sustainable takeaway to that has the power to change their life or to set them on a new course or a new direction, what would that message be? Start small and big. You can always start with a cheaper version of what you're trying to do. Then as you invest into it, you can get bigger versions. For example, I found a way to take 50 cent fans and turn them into wind turbines. Obviously they're small wind turbines, but they still work. We can, we can invest that little bit to make a bit more difference. Every bit counts. I mean, statistically, you just doing one thing isn't going to help. But you inspiring people to do one thing each is going to help. That's great. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very, very true. Uh, everybody, no matter how small, um, can do something. If you've ever slept in, in a room or tried to be in a room with just one mosquito, uh, mosquitoes pretty small, but you can realize that even the smallest thing can make a big impact or make a lot of noise and and, and uh, create some issues. And so I I would have another question for you, and that is, what should young innovators like you uh, be thinking about if they're looking for ways to make a real impact or to get started what what advice do you have there well always start small a good community i recommend for starting with electronics slash sustainable energy is arduino because then you can always invest more into it and as i said they're good for crop yields detecting crop yields for temperature monitoring to see if there's a storm coming because at the end of the day it's useful in places like africa who do not have many systems that we have in modern in the modern world to help with plants growth but we can make small versions to invest a long way. For example, you can buy a sensor nowadays, one euro, then with the screen, one euro, and then the actual Arduino, three euro. So that's only five euro, and you've got yourself a temperature monitoring station. Add a solar panel, maybe five euro, and then you've got one powered by a solar panel with some batteries, obviously. And it's pretty cheap. And it sounds like it's fun as well. It and, is. And in and, and, and that process, you get to learn and you get to experiment. You get to be hands-on. You get to see how it works, what doesn't work, how to make it more efficient. And um, so I, I really like that. Uh, as the very last thing before we say goodbye, 
Is there anything that you would like to depart to our listeners, what you'd like to tell them, um, or anything that you didn't get to say that you would like to let us know? Sure. As I said before, start small and big, but take opportunities. And if there aren't any, make them. For example, I always wanted to go to the Innovation Summit and usually there was no chance of me getting in because I was just the child. But if you take up that opportunity, you can go. If there's no opportunities, join a group that can make you get more opportunities and get them and make them. For example, I taught them how to make posters for helping children during this morally struggling time. And we did it, people benefited. If you don't have any opportunities, just make them. That's great. Do you, it's do easier you have, than it sounds. Yeah, well, no, I think you, I, I think that's great. I think uh, it's more about just doing it, just getting out there and taking that risk. It's a little of a stepping out of your comfort zone to ask the questions, to, to see how you can do it. If you don't ask, the answer is no. So I think it's, it's good that you asked and pushed your mom and that you 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 got forward and got there and look at the ripple effect that's that's occurred at the you end have, of the day a life without risk isn't a life at all yep exactly i love that thank you for departing that do you have any mentors or anybody that you follow or has really helped you or given you some wisdom on this time or people that you look up to or maybe other youth activists around the world that you're you like or you'd like to um, say that you're you're supporting them or you like what they do is there anybody like that in your life there are too many okay too many so anyone who does anything remotely good i support them i can't list them all so i'm just gonna end it at that okay well andre thank obviously you. there's you there's you <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. We're good friends and I, I, I will always stay in touch with you and I'm looking forward to very bright futures and that we see each other again uh, in the future. And if not, we'll, we'll definitely see each other online and keep, keep in touch and you'll keep me in touch on all your good progress and what's going on. Andre, thank you so much for your time and I appreciate you being on Inside Ideas. Thank you, um, actually. Please let all your friends and, and locals know to, to listen in and to like and support uh, what we do. And, and um, I Only think the people much. I know will be interested because Thank there are some people I know that will dislike. <laughs> Thank you so, very much, Andre. I really appreciate it. You have a wonderful day. You too. Thanks. Bye-bye.